Hello, good evening, welcome to Hook Not in Nottingham. I'm John O'Bullard and it's time for this week's Hockey Chat. Thanks for coming along. Uh, great to have you here and great to have so many really, really good questions this week. Uh, some real belters that have come through. Uh, so I shall look forward to discussing them throughout the show. As always, please do get involved in the discussion. You have got the chat box on here. You've also got my Twitter. I will be monitoring it throughout uh, at John O'Bullard. So if you've got any further questions to add, please do add them uh, at Twitter or on the chat box. And if you want to get involved in the discussion on anything uh, that we talk about tonight from the questions, then please do. couple of plugs before I uh, crack on with the questions in earnest. Firstly, uh, Nottingham Lions with their first, uh, well, first shutout in four or five years on Saturday night. The highlights, sorry, Sunday night, the highlights are on YouTube right now. So do go and have a look at those. Uh, cracking game. And if you've got chance to look back at the live game as well, some great discussion with Chris Gadsby and Chris Ellis who were on commentary uh, in the period break. So do check that out if you can. Also, the 4,000 and counting guys uh, on their podcast, fantastic interview with AJ Galanti. So anyone who's watched the um, Netflix documentary, uh, Crime and Punishment, it was about the Danbury Thrashers of the UHL uh, from the late 90s. Fabulous, op uh, fabulous documentary that included a lot of players who played in Britain, so the likes of David Beauregard. Uh, Ruman Under, I think Bruce Richardson was featured in it, and um, so yeah, do do check that out. It's a fabulous interview. It's about ninety minutes long, well well worth a listen. It is absolutely brilliant. So do go and check that out. That's the four thousand and counting podcast. You can find that on all good podcast providers. Hello everyone. It's nice to see so many of you here, and I do believe there's quite a few of the brand new Nottingham Lions media team. Uh, so we will be talking about things a little later as well, because we have had a question about them. So welcome along to you all. Great to have your company this evening. Uh, Anthony's in. Good to see you, Anthony. Uh, there's also uh, some NHL, uh, NIHL content as well in here this week. So something for everyone. So like I say, if you want to get involved, use the chat box or at John O'Bullard on Twitter. But we will crack on. Now, of course... Of course. Good evening, Chris. Good to have you along, mate. Um, of course, there was a big announcement this morning with some rescheduled fixtures in the Elite League. And the playoff finals weekend has been moved back a week to the May Bank holiday weekend. Um, it's gone down well in some quarters, not so much in others. So uh, a couple of questions from that. The first one from Stephen McBlain, who is a Belfast Giants fan. And he sent this actually last week. And, I, and I, I said I would hold it over to this week. Um, and he said, given the possibility that the playoffs might get put back a week, will this affect the attendance? With it being short notice and flights and hotels will have rocketed up. I booked both for the current weekend and I've seen that my hotel is a couple of hundred dearer the week after. Um, Ray Monaghan, as well, who I think is a Glasgow clan supporter, says, well, perhaps the correct sporting decision, was it right of the Elite League not to acknowledge or address the additional hassle and cost to fans by shifting player finals weekend to the bank holiday? Um, my thoughts on this, I think from a sporting perspective, it had to be done. There are, or there are 30 outstanding fixtures to fit in between now and the end of the season. By extending the season a, a week, that allows 11 fixtures of those 30 to be rescheduled straight away. So I think from a sporting point of view, a fatigue point of view, it had to be done. It's obviously going to cost the teams more because they've got to pay their players for an extra week. Um, so from a cost point of view, it's probably going to hit all the teams as well. Um, now, Obviously, it causes a lot of problems for people having to reschedule hotels to a bank holiday weekend when traditionally they are a bit more expensive. Um, however, I have seen a lot of stuff online throughout the day where, where people saying, well, surely if you was booking a hotel for the playoff weekend, considering the situation that we are in with COVID, 
why would you not book it as a flex booking? And I, I, I sort of tend to agree with that. Uh, as, as many know, I was recently uh, go, went to Scotland for the Panthers triple header weekend, which we couldn't go to because there was a restriction on the crowd. So I have flex bookings. However, we still went and just spent all three days in Edinburgh. So, you know, that was, uh, that was great. That was great. And watched the webcasts in the pub. So it was fantastic and still got a, got a weekend away. <sighs> I'm obviously in the lucky position, whereas if uh, I live in Nottingham, so I'd just be able to go and come home. I think should would had the playoffs been anywhere else, I would have done a flexible booking, um, which which is I, I think would have been the sensible thing to do in this sort of climate that we're in. Obviously, not for everybody, and I know it's cheaper to make a. Uh, at the time, booking and pay for it all there and then. But I, I just, is that a risk you you could take when with the situation that we've got? I, I'm not so sure. The other thing as well is now is now I, I I will probably be working that the new date, so I can't go anyway. Um, so it, it's priced me out. But I could totally understand why the league have moved it. I agree with what some people have said with regards that there's been no acknowledgement to fans for the hassle. And yes, the press release should have included maybe an apology that they'd had to move it, but I could really see, see nothing else they could do. And I think, you know, it was a situation where they were damned if they do and damned if they don't. Now, hindsight being the wonderful, wonderful thing that it is, you could say, why have the Challenge Cup competition that had so many games to knock out one team? That could have been thinned out. Absolutely. I totally, totally agree with that. Um, and also the hindsight, another bit of hindsight was the why announce a date with the possibility that COVID could affect the season, which is, again, a very, very valid point. Um, so I, I think it was a very difficult decision and they'd be opposition either way. Uh, from a sporting base, from a sporting base and a sporting point of view, I think it's absolutely the right decision. Um, from a fan point of view, it's a lot of hassle, and I totally appreciate that. And there, there are people who are going to miss out. Uh, I think Stephen's initial question that asked, would it affect the attendance? Maybe so. Maybe so, indeed. Um, let, let's look at some of the comments. Jamie, was it not easy to do one one of the quarterfinals in the midweek before the finals weekend as planned? Uh, you know what? That's a possibility, but you know, it, does that leave enough time? Because I know that the teams come early and train, but would that have left too little time for teams coming from further afield to not team to get everything organised? Uh, is that one? But yes, that, that's a valid, very valid point. Uh, Chris Lovell, I get what you're saying, but it's especially rough for Belfast fans. It's the most expensive for our fan base. The flights are difficult to get on a flexible basis. Yeah, uh, and that that is the fan base that is going to be um, most affected, um, definitely, with regards to this decision. Uh, a lot of places will have a COVID policy for refunds with this change won't meet because it's been moved so far ahead. Yeah, and tickets haven't gone on sale yet either, which is another thing. Also, can we blame the Challenge Cup? In hindsight, I think you can, <laughs> definitely. You are not crashing on my sofa, mate. <laughs> uh, our weekend was moved to the Bank Holiday to not clash. Our showcase weekend is now overshadowed a bit, which I don't like. I... <sighs> You know, I, 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 I'm not sure I agree with that because it's clashed with the NIHL weekend in the past. And do that many people go to both? I sort of understand that it's nice for them to have the NIHL and the EIHL to both have their own standalone showpiece weekends. And also it will affect the, um, the two-way players as well. Um, so... Yeah, yeah, that. But on, is it really that much of a problem? I don't see it as being as that much of a problem. To be perfectly honest, Anthony, with with it being on the same weekend, I think ideally you would like them to be separate. 
but I think circumstances have just meant that they will be on the same weekend. Um, Tommy says, I totally understand and I don't have an issue with it moving, but the fact that they didn't even acknowledge the fans in their post was pretty poor. Just a we apologise for the inconvenience. Yeah, totally agree with that. Would it hamper teams like Leeds in the NIHL with so many two-way players in the NIHL playoff weekend on the same weekend? Um, yes, possibly. Possibly. Uh, Anthony, is it clashed in the past and it wasn't good then? Both leagues deserve to have their moment in the sun. I totally agree. But I think this situation has been brought on by COVID. And obviously the initial plan was to have them both on separate weekends. But obviously that that isn't going to happen now. I, I appreciate it. It's absolutely not ideal. But, you know, uh, it's one of those situations where I'm afraid it, it, at the moment it is what it is. So it, it's not it's not great. I, I appreciate that. But uh, there we go. Martin Andrews as well asks, uh, Elite League moving their playoff weekend to the same weekend as the NIHL. Had their playoff weekend booked in seems silly and not a correct sporting decision for me. Uh, I, you, you're right. I think they should, it would have been great if they could have both had a separate weekend. But I think circumstances has meant that it will clash. Hopefully next season there'll be a bit more planning and a bit more contingency and they won't clash. Um, also hampering GB prep for the world championship. That's a great point, Jamie. And you know, that's something else that shouldn't be overlooked because it's another week that um Pete Russell doesn't get uh, with the players that are not uh, that are not in the um sorry. That's up off because Chris Ellis is sending me ridiculous. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Mr. Alice. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not saying that at all. Uh, let's let's have a look. Because uh, Chris, before the season started, the board must have known cancellations are possible. So the real question is, could the Challenge Cup have been either reducing size or pass for this season? Certainly, that needs looking at desperately. Um, as I said to the good Mr. Smith, points percentage on the table like other leagues in Europe, uh, a bunch of other options could have been looked at. Ultimate feels like the EIH runs roughshod a bit for me. Um, if you had points percentage or something like that, especially with the fact that not everybody has played the same number of games, you will get an absolute meltdown. That would be worse. That would be far worse. A far worse situation. Uh, I think if if you had something like that, it would it would cause an all out war, especially as Cardiff were denied the title in the nineteen twenty COVID finished early season, where they were were ahead on points percentage. If you then bring it in, there would be an all out meltdown. Uh, uh, and I think you think it would. You think this today was bad? That would be that would just be an absolute like a nuclear explosion amongst the uh, British hockey fan base. So. Uh, yeah, that, that just wouldn't work for me. Uh, agree with Jamie. Leeds in particular could lose out. Shudra and Whistle are on fire. Yeah, certainly could. Uh, I don't like the bash of the uh, elite leagues, but just a poor choice. But what do I know? You know plenty, Anthony. You probably know too much. <laughs> Having caught COVID at an indoor event has made my mind up to give it a miss, this despite being triple jab. Yeah, I mean, I I got COVID just after Christmas. No idea where I got it from. Um, but to be perfectly honest, I, I've had far worse colds. Far worse colds. Uh, and I felt a bit of a fraud, if I'm honest. Um, but for 10 days, I, I was locked up, couldn't do anything. I felt absolutely fine. Um, which is, which you know, but, 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 it, but it is what it is. It is what it is. Um Points percentage would only work if teams have played equal games and equal games against all the opponents too. Absolutely, Chris. I, I could not agree more with that. Okay, let's let's uh, move on. Uh, and a very meaty, serious question that, that came in actually quite quite late on this evening. So uh, I'd, I'd appreciate input in this one because it, it it sort of relates to not necessarily hockey but other sports at the minute. But it's, it's more of a general question. Hockey fan six five four three two one, who has been uh, a regular contributor to to these chats, 
says, do you think professional sportsmen and women convicted of serious criminal offences should be allowed to continue playing sport professionally after serving their punishment? Or do you think these privileges should be taken away for life? Um, I know that, that this has been in the past, especially over the weekend. Uh, I'm not going to mention names because I know that there's criminal investigations going on. So I want, I want to say and I, I won't talk about them. Needless to say that the um, what, what appeared on social media, I haven't listened to, I haven't heard, and nor do I want to, because I, I just don't. Um, it's not, not something I want to seek out, and it's not something I want to hear. Um, but I think anyone who is convicted of a, of a, a serious criminal offence... Um, should be locked up for a long time anyway so that so that actually playing sports professionally isn't an option when they come out of their punishment um it's a really difficult one because i think it depends on the crime if you look at for example wraith rovers who signed a player at the transfer deadline yesterday uh who has been convicted of rape uh, in, in a civil court, not in a criminal court. And the PR backlash from that has been absolutely horrendous for Wraith Rovers. To, uh, or, uh, it's not gone down well. They've lost sponsors. They've lost directors. They, they had re resignations from their women's team. And understandably so. It's been a massive backlash. And then they put out a, a statement tonight which basically said uh you know it was a footballing decision which basically for me just says screw what you think it's a footballing decision you don't care about anything else which, which has actually made things worse and it's all blown up again so the the pr for wraith rovers from that has been massively negative and a massive backlash um so it's a difficult one it for me it depends on the offense for a serious offence like rape, murder, sexual abuse, that sort of thing, I would want whoever did that crime to be locked away for a very, very, very long time. Um, so that playing sport is not really an option if and when they ever come out of prison. Uh, it is the way that I look at it. Um, it's... It's a really tough question to talk about because what, what one thing I don't like seeing is sort of a like a trial by social media. I think everything should be left to the courts. We, in this country, you are innocent before innocent until being proved guilty by a jury of your peers. Um, what we're getting more and more, and this has been more prevalent since the sort of invention of the internet, the Sort of really taking over of society by social media that these things get out there and then you know things people get convicted before they're actually convicted you know that they're they're found guilty before you know it even goes to court and not only that it also prejudices the case as well as the the one involving the manchester united footballer that's going on at the moment um so that's a difficulty as well. So from in that regard, it's really, really difficult. But, you know, if you are convicted of a serious criminal offence, you should be locked away long enough for me that, you know, it's not, not really an option to continue uh, playing professional sport because you're too old when you come out. Chad Evans, yeah, that he was Sheffield United, was he? Wasn't it Jessica Ennis had a stand named after her? And she, if he signed for Sheffield United, she wanted her name taking off the stand. Uh, that I remember that. Adam Johnson, yes, yeah, Sunderland, convicted career in ruins, then retired and found not guilty. Do players in that situation deserve another chance? I, Adam, was Adam Johnson found not guilty? I thought, thought he was still in prison. 
I like what what I did like was Wraith playing Queen of the South tonight. Queen of the South away kit is done in support of violence against women's char charities. The universe makes a point at times. It certainly, certainly does, doesn't it? Yeah, that is. Um, but yeah, great question, hockey fan. It really, really is. Um, and I know it relates to sport in general and not, not necessarily just hockey. So it's it's a, a really difficult one, and you will get people who have totally different uh, opinions about that. Chad Evans was retried. Yeah, he was retried and find not guilty, wasn't he? Um. So yeah, yeah. I don't. Uh, is Adam Johnson out now? I, I thought I thought he was still in jail. Yeah. But. Oh, there you go. Show, shows how much attention I'm paying to the news at the minute. But, uh, let's uh, let's move on. Um, Andy Tring says, what do you feel should be done to encourage elite teams to invest in the juniors? Should there be some form of financial incentive from a sports gov governing body or sports in England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland? Um, difficult one. Because... Um, there isn't a unified governing body, so that makes it difficult for investment. <clears throat> but to encourage elite league teams to invest in juniors, yeah, I, I would very much like to see this. And and, and this is something that we've, we've talked about going back several, several weeks. I mean, I, I talk about the Lions a lot and the fact that there isn't really a link with the Panthers, despite the fact that there is a junior a, a big junior hockey club playing in the same building as the Nottingham Panthers, yet there's no real pathway from the Nottingham juniors up to the Panthers, and they should be. Uh, I mentioned Manchester a lot, because Manchester have their own academy that, that the senior club is involved in, and, and they're looking to bring players through and use that academy as a production line of British talent for Manchester. But their situation is very different to the Panthers, uh, and Ryan Finity is, is very big on developing British players and what he wants is players to come through from their academy that they can bring through to Manchester give that experience and then maybe go on somewhere else um, for, for a bigger and better payday and then they bring the next one through and that's the way that they um, that's the way that they want to operate so I, I think a, a lot of clubs could do a lot worse than look at what the Manchester Storm are doing with their academy because it's not only that it's all part of the same organisation, but the, the players and the imports in the senior team get involved with the junior team and they go and they go and they uh, coach and they spend time with them and, and just help them become better players. And that's exactly how it should be. Um, I'm not so sure that is happening as much in Nottingham if it's happening at all. I'm sure if anybody's on, they could, they could say. The Panthers need to look at that young whippersnapper, Luke Thomas, from the Lions. Wow. <laughs> I'm sure Luke would love that. <laughs> Although not the way he was feeling on uh, on Monday morning. But the fact that one governing body, the one governing body proposal was rejected is insane. Too many cooks, each looking out for themselves rather than the sport. It's growth future until this you know, that changes and stays as it is. It is because the the exception is different in Manchester than the other team. The expectation is different in Manchester than the other teams. Yeah, I think that's probably a lot to do with it, Matt. Uh, you know, the, their expectations aren't necessarily as high, um, but they, they've got a plan for the future of bringing players through. And I think every club, I'd love to see every elite league club do that and work with a junior team to look at a production line of bringing players through. And it, it's one thing that, that makes me tear the rest of what little hair I've got left out is the fact that you have a, a, a national ice centre with a senior ice hockey team and you have a... You have the Nottingham Lions in NIHL one, and then you have a full junior system going right down to Pee Wee's under that, and it stops at the at the under twenties, or you know, it just stops, or at the Lions, and I, I, to me that's just ridiculous. And I think it's so short sighted of the Panthers that they can't use that system in the building that they play in to. 
blows my mind that that nothing nothing is done. Uh, and that, the next question from Ashley941300 on Twitter, he says, uh, Nottingham Lions, first shutout in five years and back-to-back wins. Should the Elite League be working more with junior teams to give young players a chance and better opportunities? Yes, 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 they should. Yes. Um, you know, you've, <laughs> the great thing about the Lions, um, and I, I wasn't there on Sunday because I was in Manchester, but Back to back wins, home wins for the, for the first time in God knows how long, um, and it just goes to show that the philosophy that Matt Bradbury and and Gloss and all the coaches have is is working. They've gone in a few seasons from taking some pretty heavy beating beatings to narrowing that gap, and now winning games. And this is all with youngsters and. A, couple of experienced players it's mainly youngsters coming through from the under 18s under 19s lions too coming through and you know uh, uh, and getting that experience learning from that experience and then turning them into a competitive team and it's it's fantastic to see it's fantastic to see and the lions advertise for to help uh, chris and myself on the media side because obviously Chris and myself are away quite a lot doing other things now. So, but we need to keep keep that uh, media momentum going. And was eight new <laughs> members of the media team there on Sunday night. And that's why you got Twitter updates. That's why you got gifts. That's why you got photos. And it was fantastic to see. And this is a, this is a third tier British hockey club but showing the way to some other clubs uh, how it can be done and how it should be done. And this is all voluntary. None of us get paid for any of this. But what it has led is that some of us have gone on to get paid for doing that. And it's such a great grounding. And the Lions deserve every single little bit of success that comes their way. And every single plaudit that comes that way, their way, they absolutely deserve. Because this is this is how you are going to build British hockey, is by giving these players a chance, by giving them the exposure, and then giving them the opportunity that they can improve their game and then move on to something better. And then you bring the next lot through that's how it should work that's how the conveyor belt should work should work and that's why i think the elite league are really short-sighted at times some of the teams because they just don't look at what talent is available to them um and and they really ought to they really ought to um Lions social media was outstanding recently. Take note, Sheffield Steelers social media team. Yeah, there's well. Yeah, let's leave that one. <laughs> let's leave that one there. But yes, <laughs> but Lions, Lions social media, how it should be done. I think uh, I think we can all agree on that. Uh, what else, Chris? Say fans need to exit seasons with lowered success. Are they prepared to do that? Our owners, because less success for Belfast, Nottingham, etc., will mean lower ticket sales. Look at Panthers' attendances. Yeah, I agree with that, but Panthers still have 14 imports and five Brits. So why not bring youngsters through? Why not cut a couple of imports and, and replace them with Brits? Why not do it? Because you know some of them Brits will bust a gut. And that actually leads on to a good question from Kenwin Jones, uh, who says, I saw Milton Keynes Lightning versus Leeds Knights on Saturday in the NIHL. Surely Brits like Harry Gulliver, Kieran Brown, uh, Shudra and Whistle should be full-time in the Elite League. I have a feeling you might agree, and you're frustrated they're not. If you had 10 minutes granted to you at the next Elite Board meeting, what's your pitch? Well, Harry Gulliver is on a two-way with the Storm, and he's had a lot uh, of uh, appearances with the Storm. Kieran Brown, um, a player who, for me, shouldn't be playing in the NIHL. He should be playing at a much higher level because he is a player I have rated for for years. Uh, I think, she, she, is it Cole, Cole Shudra? I know Tate Shudra is playing for the Scimitars, and you hear Cole Shudra and Brandon Whistle who are on two ways with the Sheffield Steelers. So they've been getting quite a bit of ice time with the Steelers, to be fair. Um, but yes, they should be full-time in the AHL, in the AIHL. The reason they're not, 
um, is because of the ridiculous 19-man roster limit in the Elite League. Uh, I'd scrap that immediately, make it put it back to 22. Um, and then what I do, my pitch to the Elite League board meeting is you need to bring imports down. You can't bring it down in a one fell swoop. You have to bring it down gradually. So I would say bring it down from 14 at the minute to 10 over the next four seasons, bringing it down by one a season. And then you can replace that import with Brits. Four lines, British players, um, you just bring more Brits through. You can see from the National League, there's so much talent in there. So much talent. And as Kenwin mentioned, there's four Brits, he's just mentioned, all playing for Leeds Knights. Straight off the bat, another another couple I, w- I will throw in uh, as well. Uh, Zane McKenzie, player uh, who, who actually played for a season in Nottingham at Genius. Uh, really good player. He's just played for the under-20s uh, GB. And also another player who is going to Milton Keynes is Morgan Clark Pizzo, who uh, was released by Peterborough, which seemed a strange decision because he's been playing at a point in game, scoring a lot of goals. So it was an odd decision, I, I feel, to, for Peterborough to release him. Um, but he's staying with the Panthers uh, as a two-way, and now he's going to be icing with Milton Keynes in, in the National League, which is, which is fantastic. I'm, I'm glad he's going He's going there, and he'll, he'll, I'm sure he'll do well there. Um Chris Payne asks, is it worth the Panthers fully investing in him into the roster full-time rather than as a two-way? They can't because of the 19-man roster limit, but I think should it increase to 22, then yes, absolutely. Um, And David Stevenson asks, what is your view on Clark Pizzo being released by Peter due to the new signings and players returning from injuries as they are concerned about his ice time and development, yet he's averaging a point per game when playing for them and one of their top players in terms of points per game average. Yeah, I just thought it was, I thought it was a really odd decision and seemed to come out of the blue, but, um, you know, he's gone to Milton Keynes, he's gone to a good club and he will develop there. Interesting Tim Wallace is at Milton Keynes as well. So he'll know all about Morgan Clark Pizzo. Uh, and I, I wonder how much he was involved with bringing him into the club. I can imagine he had quite a lot to do with it. Uh, as a Belfast on anything you do with Nottingham, however, damn you Lions, where can I buy a replica jersey? Uh, I'm sure we can, we can, uh, we can sort, sort you out, Chris. <laughs> Uh, Anthony says, Zane McKenzie, Morgan Clark Pizzo, Brendan Ayliff, Curtis Warburton, Ethan James. Yeah, all, all good players. All good players. Uh, Morgan seems to struggle size wise in the age. I, I think that's the one thing, the one thing that does probably set him back is he is quite small and quite slight. However, he is very quick, so he can avoid, um, avoid checks quite easily. I mean, if you look at the goal he scored in Manchester a couple of months ago, his, his uh, debut goal for the Panthers, it was absolutely beautiful finish. Uh, and a great find by a great find pass from uh, Matthew Toussignan as well. But it was a really, really good finish into the corner. Um, Bailey Harewood, yes, of course, Bailey Harewood uh, is uh, on the two-way with Cardiff Devils. Uh, don't, not only do we have quality bricks coming through, but a generation of high quality BAME players. Yes, we we do indeed. We do indeed. Uh, Sam Talbot and Sean Rice, a list of young bricks that should be playing in the Elite League. Uh, Matt, one of our guys now training leads in addition to Hart, Archie Hazel Dime with an aim to improve the game and bring back improvements to pass on to the team. Conversation started with Ryan Aldridge. Of course, Ryan Aldridge is a new coach in Leeds. Archie Hazel Dime, of course, gone to Leeds. Doing absolutely brilliantly. Jack Hopkins at Telford, of course, uh, on a two-way with Panthers. Um, but you know, he's another he's another player who I think will will should be playing elite league, but could possibly play a lot higher than elite league. Frankly, I think Jack Hopkins is that good. Um, so there, there we go. There's so much talent available, and I, I, Austin Mitchell King. How could I forget him? He's another player I rate really, really highly, really highly. He's at Telford as well with with Jack Hopkins. Um, 
Serious worry from a GB point of view is goaltending in four to five years will have no whistle or bounds. We don't have netminders of that quality waiting in the wings and getting ice time. I think there are netminders of that quality. They're not just they're just not being given the chance that Ben Bounds was that when he was given the chance by Hull, which then led to him going to Cardiff. Um, there are quality netminders, uh, Sam Gospel being one, uh, Curtis Warburton being another. Um, but they're not just not being given the chance. And you need someone in the elite league to take a chance on them like uh, Sylvain Cloutier took on Ben Bounds. But, you know, elite league teams that were going, oh, it's a risk, we can't do that. And, and it, it all starts again. But yeah, yeah, net minding it, it, it is a worry. Uh, I totally agree with that. Totally agree. Um, okay, a uh, couple of Panthers questions coming along now. So uh, Richard Bradley says, what are your thoughts on Brassard? Early on, it looked like him and Norwich were very similar, with Norwich the better looking prospect, but he's been excellent recently and looks to be the pick of the day. Uh, I, quite, I quite like Brassard and Norwich. Uh, I've, I, the two of the better imports for me. Um, and I think there's been a big, campaign AC Brassard to get the player of the month award, which I think he is more than deserving of. Um you know, they both look to be our most accomplished import D men at the minute. Um so yeah I, I think I think he's a he's a good D man uh Norwich as well. I think our best too and that's other but you know, we've not exactly we've not exactly been tearing up trees throughout the team, and it is a team game. But yeah, th those two have uh, been you know ones that can be probably exempt from a lot of criticism for me for for the situation that Panthers find themselves in. To be honest, uh, Adam RP eighty nine, who I believe is on, he says now that we have a new D man with seemingly quite good stats, do you think this will be enough for Panthers to turn it around or at least save face, or is it a more deep-rooted issue we are having and it's something we can't deal with this season? Um, firstly, I'm glad that we've got a sixth D man because we've played 10 games with 5D, which is just not acceptable. Uh, and it's no wonder the D are knackered and it's no wonder we, we've been losing games because you, you can't carry on with that sort of schedule with just five D-men. Um, so I'm glad it's been moved up to six. My worry is it's another offensive D-man, and we do have quite a few of those. Um, but I suppose it's a case of we need someone in. His CV isn't of... It, it, it's not outstanding, but you know, I'll give the guy a chance. I'll wait and see how he plays before before forming a proper opinion on him. And the, the fact is, he's a big guy, so hopefully he's mobile. He's young, which is also a plus in his favour. Um, can Panthers turn it around? Not <laughs> if you're thinking about winning the league. Forget that. Not a chance. Not a chance. Um, we need to go on a really good run, and I still think we the same problems are there with the fact that there there is not a lot of quality there. Uh, and the, the other fact as well is that, that the the interview with Guy Doucet, uh that was on Panthers Radio today worried me quite quite a bit because he he said something about the team the team is starting to gel. It's February; they should be starting to gel by now. If they're not gelling. If it's taken them this long to gel, then no wonder we're having problems. Um, good win on Sunday. Do I think we'll make? The, yes, I think we'll make the playoffs definitely because that's top eight. That's that's top eight. So yeah, yeah, I think we'll make the playoffs. So I don't think that I don't think there's much of an argument on that. We're certainly good enough for the top eight, no question. Um, it's just where in the league and that that comes to the next question from off the blocker who says do you think panthers will be able to maintain fourth in the league until the playoffs if not where will we finish um it's very close and i just need to get the um standings up and it's very close in that part of the league you've got five pretty much becalmed on the bottom with 13 points 
Then it's Dundee with 22, Coventry with 22, Manchester with 24, Glasgow with 24, Guildford with 26, Panthers with 29. So just seven points separating fourth to ninth. So all them places are up for grabs. I think Panthers will finish anywhere between fourth and sixth. So let's go fifth. <laughs> let's play safe and go middle and say fifth. I think, I think possibly fifth. Um, Glasgow's got a few games in hand. Um, and have been playing well up until Sunday night where they got absolutely hammered by the Storm and Storm played brilliantly in that game. Um, I think Storm have potential to make a run because they've got some really good players and are very, very strong at home. Um, Dundee, they seem to be having little runs and then they get pegged back and then they have another little few little runs. Um, Guildford are starting to find their form again. Uh, Coventry surprised me. I, I, when I saw how how low they were, and they were in ninth place a, a, a week or so ago, and I was really, really shocked with that because um, they're a good, they, they look a really good side, and, and they've got an outstanding netminder in CJ Mott, absolutely outstanding. Um, so yeah. It, I think I think Panthers will finish fourth to six. As to who misses out on the playoffs, whew, I don't think you can call that at the minute because he's just so close, so close uh, points away. So every game between those two is is going to be uh, is going to be very close. Um, David Spence, he asks, what is your thought about the director of hockey saying the team is starting to gel and we're now in February? Yeah, yeah I've, I've, co I've just covered that one. And yeah, that is a worrying, worrying statement. Also, how concerning is it when the director of hockey openly states he is lucky to get a deal done? Um, it is concerning, but I know there's been a lot of, of talk about how dry the market is. Now, I know that other teams have seemed to get really good players in and, and we've struggled um but it is a fact and it's something something i i spoke to ryan finity about a, a few weeks ago and he he was saying how dry the market is this season so i don't think it is, it's an excuse i think it is actually something that is a bit of a problem um so yeah i just yeah, you know, I, I think I think what what has happened is with Tim Wallace going, it has left Gigi set a little bit more exposed, and you know he, I, I didn't like what he said about the steam team starting to gel, because we're five months into the season and that's that's not good, and <laughs> that's not good when the team is it taking five months to gel, um, so yeah, uh, but I think with regards to lucky to get a deal done. I mean, there are there are people who will probably say that is down to contacts, that is down to uh, the markets that he's looking in, which you know may or may not be true. Um, but I think a lot more of it is to, is to do with with how dry the market is, and I think that the signing of Massey probably explains that in a way because he, he hasn't come with the greatest CV and normally at this time of year it's when Panthers bring in a couple of, of studs to sort of boost the playoff push and we've not done that um, which is what we've usually done in the past I mean it was a bit about this time of year that we bought uh, Chris Stewart in if you remember uh, two or three seasons ago and then that was that was a guy who <laughs> pretty much come from the NHL and now we get to signing a guy who, who's just come out of the French league and, and was in a pretty nondescript league before that. So it just shows how times have changed. But I think that is more down to the player availability more than anything else. And also probably the amount of money that the club are prepared to spend, especially with attendances as they are, is that spare cash available. And that's another thing that, that has to be considered, I suppose. Uh, Panthers banter, he says, with regards to the new netminder trapezium rule this season, have you noticed it having an effect at all in any games or has it changed anything? And did you think it was necessary or needed to be with? I think it was necessary and needed because pretty much every other league was playing with it. And in international games, they play with it. So I think it's important for the netminders to, to have it, seeing as it's being done pretty much everywhere else. Uh, 
I don't think it's made a massive difference. Apart from it has, I think netminders have had to be far more quick thinking and a lot better playing the puck than they had from possibly in the past because they've only got a certain area to do it in, where, whereas they didn't before. So I, I think in that respect, it's been a, a good thing. I don't think it's made a massive difference, but it has made a little bit of a difference. And the fact it's, it's happening everywhere else. Um, there, there we go. You're up to Matthew. Ari Gee's comment about the team starting to show. Does that indicate there were some bad apples that have gone now? I don't. Who knows? Unfortunately, very few of us will be privy to what goes on in the locker room. So we can only speculate on that. I, I, I wouldn't like to speculate on that. But yeah. But it is generally most of the team that was there recruited in September. So, but you know, that, that it's a fair point you make, Matthew. It, it, that could be something that he is referring to. Okay, final question, and it comes from Dave at Being It Dave on Twitter. So if you have any more questions, uh, please do uh, pop them in the chat or pop them on Twitter at John Bullard, and I will get to them. So have a think if you are still watching, um, or if you've got any comments about anything else that we, we've spoken about tonight, please do pop them in. Um, so Dave. Dave says, the Steelers owner said having Premier Sports as a title sponsor would grow the game. Since then, has the sport grown? I think it's, a, it's difficult to say because it has been a season that has been affected by the COVID pandemic. So in some markets, the crowds have grown. Uh, and for this something in Dundee, Sheffield, Manchester particularly, uh, where they have seen increases in crowds. Others have seen big fall away in crowds. So Nottingham being the prime example of that one where, um, you know, crowds have absolutely fallen off a cliff. Um, however, I think it does add some gravitas to the league, having a title sponsor and having a title sponsor like Premier Sports, because Premier Sports do do sponsor other, other competitions. And I'm thinking more... Uh, along the lines of the, the Scottish Cup, uh, the Scottish League Cup, which is the Premier Sports Club. So that is, you know, certainly good gravitas to add to the Premier, uh, to the Elite League, the fact that the Premier Sports is the title sponsor. Um, and I think that could make the league more attractive to other sponsors. Whether it grows the game, that is arguable because obviously at the same time it is a subscription channel so you have to have a subscription in order to watch it uh i think it was probably better from a broadcasting point of view when it was on free sports because free sports is obviously a free-to-air channel so anybody can, can watch it on there and it's easy for people to watch um but i think it, they are good as a title sponsor um to say whether they have grown the sport, I think it's difficult at this moment because it's COVID, because of COVID. Uh, and I thought you probably need to give it a couple of years as well, because this is obviously the first season of the sponsorship. Um, but my, my thoughts are that they, they are a very good partner for the Elite League to have. It's great that there is regular broadcasts of Elite League ice hockey. Um and I think it's good that there's a there's a title sponsor for the league as well, and and a, a, a you know a, a bona fide good name of a title sponsor because I'm sure we haven't forgot predict predict about yet, and uh, that that did not end well, did it? So you know having having someone with the name of Premier Sports, I think is is very good as a sponsor, um, but difficult to say whether it has grown the sport at the moment, but. I think we probably need to give that a little bit more time, to be perfectly honest. Games need to be shown on non-hockey nights. Yes, I would agree with that, Paul, definitely. Because um, I think there's a live game on. It's Panthers-Glasgow on Saturday. And, of course, it's Saturday night when other games are going on and the people who would normally be watching will be at games. So, yeah, I, I agree. I Maybe a midweek game, maybe a Friday night game, possibly. I think if you could... If you could have it on on a Friday night, 
uh, with no other games on. So you you then get the people watching, but also it's a Friday night, so you've got a chance of getting a, a pretty decent crowd in as well. I think I think that would really really help. Um, so you know, um, that is probably something that Premier Sports can look at because I know that the Panthers Belfast game from earlier in the season was shown on a Friday night. So so yeah, Friday night. I, I, I think Friday night, but I like Friday night hockey anyway, so uh, you know, I, I do enjoy a Friday night game. Uh, what's Jamie say? I can see the Elite League only have five to seven teams left in two years' time if they don't lower the import limit. People have been saying that for a while, though, Jamie, while it, it's it been up at 13, 14 imports, but I do think it needs to drop. I do think now is the time it needs to start dropping. Not drastically all at once but gradually and i think there needs to be a plan that over the next four or five seasons you drop it by one a season and start bringing the british players back in gradually whether that will be done or not we, we shall see but i think I, I think that needs to start being look, looked at especially looking at the success of the elite series um last april because i thought that went down really well and that was only imports Four line hockey with Brits, and it was really good. I really, really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. And I think the, the other thing as well is that a crowd can have a lot more affinity and a lot more connection with British players than they can with imports at times. Yes, imports will bring the quality. And I think if you reduce the import levels, that leaves more of your budget available to spend on imports. So you can get better quality imports through. Cost is a factor. Yeah, of course it is. Of course it is. I mean, I, I go back right, right to the days where it was just three imports, but those three imports had to be absolutely spot on and scoring millions of points a season. And if you weren't, you were straight out of the door and another one was brought in. Because if you think about it, uh, and for those that go back that far, the imports that were around in the three import dates in the days, and I'm thinking the sort of your, your Rick Brabant's, uh, your Paul Ades, for example, they went on to play in the Super League and were still top players when it was the Super League for people who go that back, back that far, which shows how good a quality your imports had to be in the, in those sort of three import systems. So, okay. um, yeah, I, I, I think the lower the import limit, the better quality imports you can bring through. Um, but we shall see. Every week, Durham, yes, the famous Durham revolving door. <laughs> Yeah, if you didn't cut it at the Durham Wash, you were out very quickly. Very quickly indeed. Right, uh, 52 minutes we've been going. So uh, your chance to get any last questions in. So on Twitter, at John O'Bullard, on here, uh, just pop them in the chat. Um, obviously, uh, Panthers with a double home header this weekend, which is, which is unusual. So Glasgow, which is live on Premier Sports on Saturday night, and then Fife Flyers on Sunday. Uh, so any more questions before I go? If not, I will close up right here. Uh, just to say thank you so much to everyone who's joined in. Great to have you uh, all joining in on the chat and so many comments. So thank you very much for that. Thank you to everyone who sent questions in. Some really, really good uh, questions that I really had to think about this week. So thank you very much for that. Um Hopefully be back uh, on Tuesday next week. If you've got any questions in the meantime throughout the week, don't wait. You can send them through to me anytime at Johnny Bullard on Twitter. Uh, my direct messages are always open, so you are always welcome to send them through that way. Um, Saturday Night Hockey in Nottingham, what is this sorcery? <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, mm. Will I be at Lions on Sunday? Uh, probably not. I will be at the Panthers game on Sunday. Uh, I'm working Saturday. Uh, and hopefully, I'll be able to get back in time to go to the uh, to go to the Glasgow game. But I, I might miss some of the first period, if not all of it. Uh, I can imagine the palpitations in Belfast if they have three imports. Oh, oh, but wouldn't it be fun? Wouldn't it be fun? Right, everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, take care. Enjoy your hockey next week. And I will speak to you all next week. All being well. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.